is your picture of God? Father's Day is a good time to ask this question because just as with Mother's Day, whenever we talk about our parents and our starting places, our families of origin, a lot of stuff comes up, mixed emotions in us. There's this stuff in us that we get from our parents, from our starting places that affects everything we think and everything we do, whether positively or negatively. And one of the most basic things that we get from our starting places is our picture of God. On a recent podcast episode uh, from NPR, one of the hosts were talking about implicit bias, this thing that we're all talking about lately, this phrase that means what we do with our reactionary decisions come from our subconscious thought. One of the hosts said something that I think is so critical for us to understand this morning that I want to start with this quote. She said, we don't float free as self-determined island. We live in a world with a history, in many cases an unfortunate history, passed down in concept form from generation to generation. But that history doesn't have to be our future. I think that's so well said. I think that's a good place for us to start this morning. Because we are affected by the history that we are becoming part of. And that history is passed down from generation to generation in concept form. Investigating that concept is what we're doing this morning when we ask the question, what is our picture of God? I had a class once in which the professor wanted each student to share their story of how they came to faith in Christ. And there was a bunch of dramatic stories, really, truly miraculous stories, some really radical transformation. But then there was this one guy, and he shared that he couldn't remember a time when he didn't believe in Jesus and want to follow Jesus because of his dad. He said he remembers his dad reading his Bible every day. And his dad was a loving, caring father, and he wanted to be just like his dad, and he wanted to love Jesus just like his dad. And then he said something that I'll never forget. He said, my story is the story that I want for each and every one of your kids. He said, I want them to never know a day when they didn't love Jesus because of you. And that's been really meaningful to me because I never met my biological father. And I was raised by a single mother who suffered from mental illness, who sometimes abused me and sometimes neglected me. So I didn't have that kind of loving, supportive family that built into me a loving picture of God. And so when Oshita and I started our own family, we had to be very intentional about creating that kind of environment for our kids. We wanted to break the cycle in our family histories and start a new heritage of love and faith that our children could live into because we believe in the power of our witness to shape our children's picture of God. But of course, this isn't easy. We're imperfect people. We make mistakes too. And both Oshita and I have to keep confronting our, the ways our experiences affect our thinking and our picture of God. We have to keep asking ourselves, what is the picture of God that's operating below the surface here? And that's what today's message is all about. I want us to investigate together, to explore together how our picture of God influences us. And by how harnessing this truth, we can bring to the surface, confront and reject false pictures of God while embracing a Jesus-looking picture of God a picture that God has come in the flesh personally to communicate and reveal. That NPR podcast suggested that one of the ways that we break these habits of mind that are involved in implicit bias is with this uh, helpful little three-word phrase, detect, reflect, and reject. And I think that's really good, but I think it's missing something important. Not only do we need to be able to bring to the surface our subconscious thinking, and not only do we need to be able to analyze and correct negative pictures, but we also need a positive picture to embrace, an alternative. So I think a shorthand way of describing this work that we're going to do today is uncover, confront, and Christ. Uncover is the work of bringing our subconscious pictures of God to the surface. Confront is the work of analyzing and rejecting false pictures of God. And Christ is the work of embracing the God revealed in Jesus. But before we dive into this work, would you join me in a quick word of prayer? Holy God, you are uniquely good. You are love. Jesus called you Abba, Father. 
But we confess thinking of you as father is challenging for many of us. We've had earthly fathers who've shaped our view of fatherhood, and some of that can be painful. So God, today we pray that you would help us to clear away the fog and see you clearly. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would reveal the truth about God's love to us by your word. Lord Jesus, you are God's word in the flesh. May we see you clearly this morning. By the power of your spirit, open our eyes to see what's below the surface. Give us courage to confront and reject the false pictures of God that we've inherited or have been given to us by our experiences. Open our hearts to embrace you, Jesus, the only completely true picture of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and all God's people said, amen. Amen. In our exploration of our picture of God, we're going to start where the Bible starts, in the beginning, with this biblical picture that's painted by this story of the garden, in which God placed humanity, and God gave humanity a unique calling different from all the other creatures that God had created. Humans are called uniquely to reflect God's loving care for creation into the world and then to gather up creation's praises and to communicate those back to God. It's a priestly and a royal calling. And the Bible calls this calling bearing the image of God. It's critical to see this because if we miss this part of the story, we may begin to tell a different story about our beginnings, and about our calling. The Bible begins with a story of a good creator God, God's good creation, and humanity called with a royal and priestly calling to reflect the image of God. The picture we get of God in this story is a picture of of a God who is an abundant provider, an intimate, loving partner, one who walks with them in the garden, who meets all of humanity's needs, gives them the authority to create culture, to cultivate God's world, world, and is present with them in a personal and loving way. What's communicated in this story is is that God gives them all these trees to eat from, and that's his abundant provision. God gives them work to do. That's his calling, his commissioning. And then he walks with them in the garden. And that's his personal loving presence. But there's something in this story that we have to be careful not to miss. Because this story is not just a story that happened far, far away, long time ago. This is our story, collectively and individually. Individually and collectively, we bear this calling. And individually and collectively, we have fallen victim to corrupting powers, just like the characters in this story. We've re- which has resulted in us becoming rebels. We must pay attention to what's at the heart of this fall in the story. The story takes a turn when humanity is tempted by a corrupting power and chooses to rebel against God, rejecting their calling to reflect the image of God. And instead, they begin to reflect the image of this dark power. We relinquish our authority and forfeit our calling when we begin to reflect the corrupting powers that are tempting us. And then, in a very real way, all hell breaks loose in our lives. What happens in the story is that the corrupting power played by the serpent begins to call into question the good picture of God. The serpent suggests that God isn't being entirely truthful with humanity. God isn't really as loving as God seems. It may seem like God has provided for all of humanity's needs, but God is holding back. At the heart of the fall in our lives and in this story is a distortion of our picture of God. Every injustice, in fact, in our world results in and is birthed from a distortion of our picture of God. And a distorted picture of God, catch this, distorts us as well. It distorts the image of God in us. The distorted pictures of God that result in rebellion and destruction in our lives are that God really isn't an abundant provider. God hasn't really called and gifted us to be the people that we were meant to be. God hasn't really, isn't really a loving and caring presence in our lives. At the heart of all our distorted pictures of God is fear. Fear is the weapon that the corrupting powers use to assault our good picture of God. 
fear distorts our picture of God like a funhouse mirror. When we see this, it can help us because we can harness this truth to bring to the surface that picture of God that's being distorted, that's hidden below, and we can expose it to the light. So let me ask you a series of rhetorical questions. Think about these for, for a moment. What are you afraid of this morning? What is it that really grips your heart with fear? What is it that makes you feel insecure? What is it that makes you feel threatened? What is it that makes you feel vulnerable and exposed? Back in the Transformation from the Heart series, we learned that resentment could be a, a, a bloodhound that helps us sniff out the self-indulgence down below. In the same way, fear can be a bloodhound to help us sniff out the picture of God that's being distorted. Are you afraid that God won't provide for all your needs? Then that's because the picture of God that's being distorted is God's loving provision. It points to a distorted picture of God who neglects his children and who isn't an abundant provider. Are you afraid that you're inadequate in some way, that you don't measure up, that you're not good enough? Then that points to a distorted picture of God that he hasn't given you a royal and priestly calling, that he hasn't called and gifted you to be the person that you were meant to be. Are you afraid that you'll be hurt, that you'll be exposed? That points to a distorted picture of God, that he's not a loving, protecting father. A God who won't stick with you no matter what. A God who will leave you and forsake you. That's the distortion that our fear points to. God's word shows us that all of our fears point to a way in which our picture of God is being distorted. Many of you know this already, but back in 2005, Oshida and I lived in New Orleans, and we had dedicated our lives to serving there uh, in an under-resourced community, and we were, we were bound and determined to live and uh, the rest of our lives serving in that community. But 2005 is also when Katrina came through, and Katrina uprooted us and changed all of our plans. And we were evacuated to Texas when we were watching the news with millions of other Americans. And I remember the moment when I heard a reporter say, they're not letting residents back in the city for weeks, possibly months. And I was immediately gripped by fear. It was the moment I realized that I was effectively homeless. And I realized we didn't know where TJ was going to be born. Rashida was eight or nine months pregnant with TJ, our second son. Questions of where are we going to live? What are we going to do? Where is TJ going to be born? Gripped my heart. And it's natural to experience that kind of fear when circumstances arise in our lives that threaten us. And we're confronted with things that we're, we're not aware of, we're below the surface. That fear was there all along, but it just, these circumstances rose it to the surface. And it made me ask questions like, is God really an abundant provider? Is he really going to meet all of our needs? Does he really own the cattle on a thousand hills, like church folks say? Or is it true that God really can't help us now? Jesus once rhetorically asked, which of you fathers, if your son asked for a fish, would give him a snake instead? Oshida and I had to wrestle with our fear. And we had to make it submit to our good picture of God. But it wasn't easy. It took the care and support of our sisters and brothers in Christ. It took praying through tears and crying out to God in lament. Where are you? What are you doing? Are you asleep? That's how I feel sometimes when, when I hear these reports of uh, verdicts coming down that are completely unjust. Where are you, God? Are you asleep? Are you seeing this? The only reason we were able to press on with courage and believe that God would meet us in Boston and supply our needs is because we had a good picture of God. God is a loving, providing Father. And in the end of that story, God did provide for us in Boston. There were even times when God's provision felt almost miraculous. So we're thankful for that. But it's unlikely that anyone here is going to go through that kind of hurricane scenario. Hopefully not. But in your life, there may be some similar circumstances that are making you feel unrooted. Maybe, there's, maybe it's not external to you. Maybe it's internal. Maybe there's some internal upheaval that you're feeling right now. 
whatever it is that you may be experiencing now or that you may experience in the future, let the fears that rise to the surface be the bloodhound that sniffs out how your picture of God is in danger of being distorted. Let the fear uncover those false pictures of God that you can confront through lament, through leaning on the body of Christ, and through being saturated in Scripture and prayer. But it's also true that not every fear is as easily recognizable as a hurricane taking away your home. Some of our fears are not as obvious as that. They, they lurk beneath the surface, and they're enmeshed in our experience of the world. We can't clearly pinpoint what exactly it is we're afraid of. Sometimes our fears can hide in a mix of legitimate concerns and other motives. When that happens, we need another way to bring to the surface our hidden thinking so that we can reject our distorted pictures of God. And this is where Jesus' parables come in. Jesus' parables are brilliant. They are a way, a subversive way of bringing to the surface the things that are below Do you remember when Jesus used a parable to expose the prejudice of Judeans against Samaritans? He told us a parable in which a Samaritan was the hero of the story. And everyone was angry because it brought to the surface their fear and their hatred of the Samaritans. Jesus was brilliant at this. In the parable that we heard read aloud earlier, Jesus tells a story about servants who were entrusted by their master with a very valuable investment. And for Jesus' Judean audience, that would have immediately signaled that he was talking about Israel. And this is why. Because Israel was entrusted by God with a very valuable investment, the law and the covenants. And they were God's servant. But in the story, Jesus talks about one of the servants who took his master's investment and hoarded it He kept it hidden away in a cloth rather than investing it so that it would produce a return. Israel was entrusted with the law and the covenants, not merely so they could bask in their chosenness. They were invested with this great, valuable investment so they could be a blessing to the whole world. But over the centuries, Israel's rivalries with other nations around them resulted in wars and destruction of the temple and exile. And by the time of the prophet Jonah, Israelites like Jonah didn't want to see God bless the other nations around them, especially not their enemies like the Assyrians. So what happened when Jonah was called to invest, to get a return on that investment? He ran and hid. He ran the other way. So Jonah is like that wicked servant who tried to bury the investment of the master. This is why when the master returns from his travel in Jesus' parable, the wicked servant says, Sir, here is your mina. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. You take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Did you hear him say that he, his fear drove his actions? It's exactly what he said. When our fears are so enmeshed with other motives, it can be very difficult to clearly identify them, and then to reject the distorted picture of God that they reveal. That is why we should look to another another bloodhound, another way to sniff out where that fear is, is from, and that's our actions. Our actions say what we're really afraid of. In the case of the third servant, his actions betrayed his fear that the master was a hard man. His fear that the master would reap where he did not sow. This is like Jonah who said, I knew you were going to be merciful to those Ninevites. I knew you'd forgive them. Jonah's fear that God would be merciful to Jonah's enemies led him to run and to hide. And the humans in the garden, their fear of God's judgment led them to run and to hide among the trees. And this third servant's fear of his master led him to hide his master's investment. So fear leads to hiding words and actions. If we're not clearly able to identify our fears so that we can see the way that our picture of God is being distorted, our actions can help us sniff them out. Working backwards from our actions, they can tell us what it is we're truly afraid of and what we can bring to the surface and confront. 
So let me ask you another set of rhetorical questions. What are the hiding words and the hiding actions in your life today? In other words, what are the words or actions that you use to avoid confronting your fears that are deep within? What are the ways in which you are hiding from God, hiding those fears, which is leading to a distorted picture of God? Or here's another question. What is the investment from God that you've hidden? What has God entrusted you with that now you're hiding out of fear? God has given us his spirit to search our hearts and to bring to light these things. But sometimes we need each other to help shine a light on our hearts, to see our own blind spots, the fears that are below the surface. I think that we can see the spirit at work in a community when we're seeing this work being done, when we're seeing individuals filled with the Holy Spirit lovingly confronting one another about the blind spots that we have in our lives. I think that's the work of the Spirit. I've had to do some of this work in my own life, and I've been very grateful to sisters and brothers who've helped me uncover the negative, distorted pictures of God in my life. And here's a biggie. Here's one of the big ones. I feel like for a long time, I've had an angry and vindictive picture of God. Can anybody relate to that? Anybody ever grow up and your picture of God was that at any moment he's going to zap you with a lightning bolt? Did he see what I just did? Oh, man, I know he's, he's really mad. I think that that picture of God is a really harmful one. I think it's one that we have to surface, confront, and replace. I'm hoping today that the Spirit will drop something in your heart, in your mind, that will help protect you from from those kind of distorted pictures of God. But not only do we need to be able to surface and uncover those things, and not only do we need to be able to confront them, we also need an alternative to embrace. And that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus is the one true, complete picture of God. His person and his life, his work, all of it is what we should be moving towards and living into. Here's how the Apostle Paul put it. He said, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. We sang about that earlier. For he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Listen to this. Once you were alienated from God, and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. Do you hear that? Distorted pictures of God. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical blood through death to present you holy in his sight, without blemish and free from accusation. Amen. That's good. Jesus is the complete, perfect image of God in the flesh. Through Jesus' human life, God has revealed his character and nature to the world once and for all. Jesus is what God looks like. We were once alienated from God. We were rebels, enemies in our minds because of evil behavior. But through Jesus, we are reconciled to God, for he has made peace through his blood. One of my favorite all-time quotes from the bishop, N.T. Wright. You know I had to quote the bishop, right? Okay, this is one of my all-time favorites. If you want to know who God is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it means to be human, look at Jesus. If you want to know what love is, look at Jesus. If you want to know what grief is, look at Jesus. And go on looking until you're not just a spectator, but you're actually part of the drama which has him as its central character. That's it. That's the whole thing. As human beings, we live leaning forward. We're moving forward into a vision, into a picture. What is that picture that we're leaning forward and moving into? 
Is it a picture of our self-preservation out of fear? If it is, then we're going to live into a distorted picture of God. The author of Hebrews writes, Since the children have flesh and blood, Christ, too, shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by what? By the fear of death. Jesus reveals to us a God who loves us so much, he came and assumed our humanity, suffered the way that we suffer, and died an excruciating death on the cross. And Jesus also reveals a God who is powerful enough to break out through death and out the other side. And when death is defeated, we have nothing left to fear. But I have to admit, even knowing all this, it's not easy for us to embrace a Jesus-looking picture of God. And there's several reasons why that's true. But one of those reasons why is because there's many competing visions of Jesus, competing pictures of God. And another reason is that our subconscious might tell us that it's too good to be true. Our subconscious might tell us the other shoe has got to drop. But embracing this Jesus-looking picture of God, I'm convinced, is the most important thing in our Christian faith. I think everything flows from this. I think to the extent that we can embrace this Jesus-looking picture of God, is the extent to which our love for God can flourish. And when our love for God flourishes, it overflows into others through our relationships. Jesus said the most important commandment is this, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. I submit that we can only love our neighbors as ourselves to the extent that we have embraced this Jesus-looking picture of God's love. That is why I'm going to close this message with two concrete ways for us to embrace this Jesus-looking picture of God. The first one is to recognize Jesus' love in others. The Apostle Paul writes that the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. What this tells us is that the revelation of God's love shines in us and through us to others. This means that one of the ways that we can learn to embrace this Jesus-looking picture of God's love is to recognize it in others. As I shared earlier, my home life, my starting point, my family of origin, did not equip me with this Jesus-looking picture of God's love. But there was one family member who showed me glimpses of it, and I didn't realize that until, I was, until much later, until I was an adult. My grandfather gave me glimpses of God's love. He passed away of heart failure at 91 uh, back in March. And I had the privilege of sharing at his, his homegoing ceremony. And as I, as I reflected back over what he meant to me, his life meant to me, I was struck by how much God's love shined through him. My grandpa revealed the joy and the delight that God experiences over me. My grandpa revealed how playful God is toward me. My grandpa revealed how forgiving God is towards me. My grandpa, he contributed to a Jesus-looking picture of God's love. So let me ask you this. Who are the people in your life? Family members, friends, sisters and brothers in Christ who reflect the love of Christ to you. And I want to give you a challenge. Here's your challenge. I challenge you to recognize the love of Christ shining through them to you and then to express that recognition somehow. Tell them about it. Talk to them about it. Write about it. Write them a note. Because I believe that as we do this, we could build a virtuous cycle of encouragement. And we could all share in the love of Christ that shines through each other. The second way that I think that we can embrace, a concrete way to embrace Jesus' love, is by contemplating Jesus' love with our imaginations. 
Here's the Apostle Paul again. He writes, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Until a few years ago, I didn't know anything about imaginative prayer. This was a new concept to me. But I realized that imaginative prayer has been practiced by Christians around the world for centuries. A famous example of imaginative prayer is the spiritual exercises by Ignatius of Loyola. And uh, in your bulletin, there's a, an, ex an example of that. You can practice this later this week. It's a gospel story that you can imagine yourself being a part of. And the, the, the printout that I gave you in your bulletin walks you through how to do that. The idea is really simple. Our imaginations have a powerful effect over how we experience God in concrete ways. The distorted pictures of God that lurk below the surface, that we've rooted out, are, have to be replaced with a concrete picture of God's love. Now, this seems a little bit weird at first, using our imaginations, because many of us have been taught that our imaginations are for make-believe and for things that aren't real. But the truth is, our imaginations is where we make memories. It's where we make memories concrete to us. And it's also true, it's our imaginations that give us a conception, a concept of our relationships with others. I'll give you an example. If I have a concept of my wife being angry at me, the next time we have a conversation, it might be a tense one. And she might not even be angry at me. But my imagination built a conception of anger, and now my posture to her, towards her is changed. So in our imaginations, we have the power to, to um, tell a true story about God's love. And that true story about God's love can become concrete to us and replace the distorted pictures of God. So I want to close with a brief imaginative, imaginative prayer exercise that we're going to do together. In a moment, I'm going to pray that we'll surrender our hearts and minds to the Lord. And after that, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and use your imaginations. The idea here is to be open to what God might do in this moment. Open to this experience. Open to what God might teach you. So it's important that you pay attention. Let's pray. God, you are the source of all light, all revelation by your word. By your word, you give light to our souls we pray that you would pour out on us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, that our hearts and minds may be open to know your truth and your way. Amen. If you're comfortable doing so, I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. In your imagination, I want you to imagine you're sitting with Jesus. Jesus is sitting across from you. And in your imagination, Jesus is is smiling at you. There is warmth in his presence. You know that Jesus loves you exactly as you are. No, need, no words need to be said. It's understood. In between you and Jesus, there are no tables. There are no obstacles at all. You're just sitting right in front of Jesus. And as you imagine Jesus there smiling at you, full of love, I want you to be aware of what you're experiencing, the feelings that may come to the surface. Pay attention to how you're feeling about this interaction. What sometimes surfaces are feelings of shame. What sometimes surfaces are feelings of distance, like you haven't been there for a while. Other times what surfaces is pain, wounds, hurt. Sometimes what surfaces is a deep longing for something that you didn't even know was there. Take a moment, take 30 seconds to sit with Jesus and pay attention to what surfaces. Whatever comes to the surface, whatever feelings aroused in you, I want you to imagine them as an object. Choose an object to represent those feelings. Give it a shape. Imagine that object. 
Now I want you to imagine yourself laying that object at Jesus' feet. Hand it over to Jesus. Peter said, cast all your anxiety on Jesus because he cares for you. By laying this object down before Jesus, as he smiles over you in love, you relinquish it to him. You bear it no more. Whatever distorted pictures of God you had, whatever fears, whatever insecurity, whatever wounds, they're not yours anymore. You've given them to Jesus. Now imagine Jesus takes that object and he sets it aside. It's no longer relevant. You've relinquished your, your fears to Jesus. I like to end my imaginative prayer times with Jesus with Jesus giving me a big hug, the way I hug my son or my daughter, full of love and full of joy. When you've imagined that, you can, you can open your eyes. I want to encourage you to use your imaginations to embrace a Jesus-looking picture of God, a picture that frees you from all fear and all distortions. My hope this week is that by being attentive to our fears and our actions motivated by fear, that we'll be able to uncover those distorted pictures of God, confront them, and replace them with a Jesus-looking picture of God. Let's pray. Holy God, you are love. Thank you for revealing yourself in Jesus, a person of flesh and blood like us, a person who walked through this life the way we do, even suffering the way we do, even dying an excruciating death on the cross. Thank you, Father, for showing your great love through Jesus' humanity. And thank you, Father, for raising Jesus from the dead so that we have nothing left to fear. Because of your great love, we can uncover and confront every distorted picture of you that comes from our fears and embrace the true image of God revealed in Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us to recognize Christ's love in others and to contemplate Christ's love in our imaginations so that we may love you with our whole hearts, with our whole souls, and with our whole minds and love our neighbors as ourselves. In the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.